sign of the manger. If you haven't already, why don't you pause at this point to read this week's passage, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, a very familiar passage, then resume the DVD. Oh, how cute to see some girl's doll, recruited at the last minute and wrapped tightly in a blanket, lying amidst the straw of an X-ended manger that dwells the remainder of the year in the church attic. Jessica stands in for Mary, while Robert, the tallest boy in Sunday school this year, makes a perfect Joseph, once they've applied the fake beard. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against nativity scenes, but we've seen so many, year after year, that it's hard for us to read scripture and see with fresh eyes what it actually says to us. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, makes four important points about the birth of Jesus. One, Jesus is born in history. Two, Jesus is born in David's birthplace. Three, Jesus' birth is attended by hardship. Four, Jesus is born in humble circumstances. Let me read verses 1 and 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Jesus has an historical context. He is neither a myth nor a legend. He is both historical and verifiable. He is mentioned not only in the New Testament, he is mentioned by contemporaries in early documents such as Josephus, Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius, Bar Serapion, Thallus, Lucian, and the Talmud. Jesus is a person in history. Jesus' historical setting includes rulers Caesar Augustus, Herod the Great, and Quirinius. Caesar Augustus, Roman Emperor Octavian, ruled 27 BC to 14 AD. Herod the Great, called King of the Jews, ruled Judea from 40 to 4 BC. Quirinius was a military leader and Roman consul in Central Asia Minor and later imperial legate of Syria Cilicia in 6 to 9 AD, where Josephus notes that he conducted a census. The census in our passage isn't recorded elsewhere, but makes sense. Perhaps under a kind of extraordinary command authority Quirinius possessed during his military maneuvers in Cilicia, or during a brief earlier stint as governor in Syria. Well, let's pause now for discussion question one, based on verses one and two. Why does Luke name the rulers? What point is he making? Pause the DVD now. Let me continue with verses 3 to 4. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. The second point of our passage is that Jesus was born in the birthplace of David, Israel's greatest king. Nearly 1,000 years before Jesus' birth, God had promised to David through the prophet Samuel in 2 Samuel 7, 16, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Micah had also prophesied of Bethlehem as the birthplace of the Messiah in Micah 5, 2. The Jews eagerly expected David's successor, and call this hoped-for Messiah the Son of David. Jesus is the Son of David, this promised king. It is no accident that Joseph was of the house and lineage of David and that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Let's look at verses 5 to 6. 
He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. The most glorious event in all history is about to unfold. But for Mary and Joseph, it is drudgery and hardship. Mary and Joseph live in Nazareth, four days' journey at least north of Bethlehem. Mary is pregnant. A journey late in pregnancy is arduous for her. But if she stays in Nazareth, she has to face the scandal alone. Luke puts it delicately. Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child, verse 5. Compounding that, it could have well been winter if second century church tradition is to be taken seriously. An arduous journey in winter, a pregnant teenage mom. (laughs) Who says that following God's plan is easy? Just because we face hardships and obstacles is no indication that God is absent, that we've somehow missed his will. Well, let's pause again, this time for discussion question two. Why do you think the journey to Bethlehem was difficult for Mary? Is pleasure an indication that we are in God's will or not? Any examples from your life? Here's an extra credit thing you can discuss if you like. Argue for or against this proposition. Being a consistent Christian causes more hardships than just going with the flow. Pause the DVD now and discuss these and then turn it on when you've finished your discussion. Let's go on to verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The manger astounds me. The holy son of God was born in a stable or cave where animals were kept and his first crib was a common cattle trough. Why? Though Jesus was by very nature God, he didn't grasp at his prerogatives or flaunt his rights. Instead, according to Philippians 2.7, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The Greek word here means make empty. Jesus literally emptied himself. Of all the privileges to which he was heir, he didn't just take a low place, he took the lowest place. His commission was to preach good news to the poor. So he was born among the poorest of the poor. His disciples argued about who would be greatest in the kingdom, but Jesus stopped them short. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. The manger represents this kind of service. But the manger is more than a symbol of humility. God planned it as a sign. Let's read on in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Sheep raised on the hillsides around Bethlehem, may well have been destined for temple sacrifices in Jerusalem, only six miles to the north. Jeremias describes a shepherd's lifestyle, I'm quoting, The dryness of the ground made it necessary for the flocks of sheep and cattle to move about during the rainless summer and to stay for months at a time in isolated areas far from the owner's home. Hence, herding sheep was an independent and responsible job. Indeed, In view of the threat of wild beasts and robbers, it could even be dangerous. Sometimes the owner himself or his sons did the job, but usually it was done by hired shepherds who only too often did not justify the confidence reposed in them." Some of Israel's great heroes were shepherds, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. But in the first century, it seems, Shepherds, specifically hireling shepherds, had a rather unsavory reputation. The rabbis are quoted as saying, Most of the time they were dishonest and thieving. They led their herds into other people's land and pilfered the produce of the land. 
because they were often months at a time without supervision, they were often accused of stealing some of the increase of the flock. Consequently, the pious were warned not to buy wool, milk, or kids from shepherds on the assumption that it was stolen property. Shepherds lived outside most of the year. Flocks were kept outside in this way from April to November and sometimes during the winter in suitable locations. Shepherds were constantly with their sheep since the sheep were vulnerable to all kinds of trouble. One minute the shepherds are talking quietly in the blackness of the winter sky. The next moment the hillside is ablaze with light and booming with the voice of an angel. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. <laughs> the brightness is more than just mega candle power. It is the radiance of God's own glory. Glory refers to the condition of being bright or shining, brightness, splendor, radiance. Throughout the Old Testament, the presence of God is referred to as overwhelmingly bright, burning as fire, such as the, the cloud above the tabernacle by day and the pillar of fire by night. God's angels sometimes bear this same bright glory. In this case, the glory shines around the whole area. The shepherds are frozen in terror. This word, terrified, sore afraid, means literally feared with a great fear. <laughs> well, let's pause now for discussion question three, based on verses seven and eight. Why do you think the message of Jesus' birth comes to shepherds of all people? Why is Jesus born in a stable with a manger for a bed? This has to be intentional. What point is God making? Pause the DVD now, then resume when you're finished. The angel moves first to calm their fears in verses 11 and 12. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This good news angel has the enviable task of being the first herald of Messiah's birth. Bring good news or bring good tidings is the Greek verb euangelizo, from which we get our English word evangelize. Here it means bring good news, announce good news. Later in the New Testament, it is used widely for proclaim the message of salvation, preach the gospel. This very good news that results in joy, intensified by the Greek adjective megos, great, above the standard in intensity. This is great joy, indeed. Notice how broad is the angel's message. It is not just for the pious or for the Jew, but for all the people. What wonderful news for those who are estranged from God and struggling under oppression. The baby is not just born to Mary and Joseph. The baby is born to you, to the shepherd recipients of the message and all others. The town of David reminds the reader of the Messiah child's connection with his ancestor David. Prophecy indicates that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. And what a fitting prophecy for those Bethlehem shepherds to recall, given 730 years previously by the prophet Micah. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. What a wonderful passage. The angel also calls this baby Savior. The Greek word indicates one who rescues, Savior, Deliverer, Preserver. In the prophecies about Jesus' birth in Luke 1 through 3, we observe this theme several times. 
In Luke 4, 18 to 19, Jesus quotes Isaiah to spell out his mission this way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This Savior will bring both salvation from enemies and from sin, but not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, to all people. Finally, the angel utters the words that Jews had longed for centuries to hear. He is Christ the Lord. Messiah. This child is Messiah. Our English word Christ, of course, comes from the Greek adjective Christos, anointed, which translates the Hebrew Mashiach, transliterated in English as Messiah. The angel's declaration, however, doesn't use the word Christ by itself, but in the phrase Christ the Lord. Lord, kurios, means owner, lord, master. It's a designation of any person of high position. Jews were used to reading Lord whenever the divine name Yahweh appeared in Scripture, so to Jewish ears, these two words, Christos and kurios, spoke of divinity. The meaning seems to be the highest conceivable and most lofty designation of Christ. That is the Lord Messiah, or the Messiah and the Lord, with connotations of kurios used of Yahweh himself, rather than just of an exalted personage. Jesus is a Savior who can be regarded as the Messiah, Yahweh. The implications of this exalted title are staggering. But let's pause now for discussion question 4, based on verse 11. What are the three titles of Jesus given by the angels. What does each mean? What does this tell us about Jesus' true identity? Pause now uh, the DVD and then resume when you finish discussing. The shepherds are given a sign that the angel's message is true. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. These were strips of cloth like bandages wrapped round and round young infants in order to keep their limbs straight or some, some reason. The word sign means a sign or distinguishing mark whereby something is known, a token, an indication. This sign that the shepherds were given consists of two elements. One, the baby is wrapped in cloths. Two, the baby is lying in a manger. However, the second sign that the newborn would be found in a manger, that was unique. The word means a, a feeding trough or a crib on which cattle were fed. A manger would indicate the location in some kind of stable. A second century legend indicates that this was a cave, but we just don't know. After the angel's startling declaration, the heavens reveal a huge crowd of angelic beings. Verses 13 and 14 read, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The crowd is described with two phrases, a great company, or multitude, and heavenly host. Host is the Greek noun stratia, a military term that means army. God's heavenly army is mentioned several times in Scripture. This heavenly army is praising God. It may have been a heavenly choir as in popular Christmas lore, but the Scripture doesn't explicitly say that they are singing as the angels in Revelation. Here they seem to be chanting in unison or speaking. The content of their praise is, one, to give glory to God, and two, to offer a blessing of peace to men. Glory is used here in the sense of honor as an enhancement or recognition of status or performance. Fame, recognition, renown, honor, prestige. The angels promise peace. Peace between God and mankind, which essentially amounts to salvation. We're used to the wording of the King James Version 
on earth peace, goodwill toward men, but more ancient Greek manuscripts indicate a better translation, on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The idea is that God extends his peace and salvation to his favored people, those whom he sovereignly chooses or elects to favor and save. Now the shepherds have a choice. Verses 15 to 18 pick up the story. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. They hurry to Bethlehem. Where do you find a manger? In a stable, of course. So they check out the stables in this village and come across one with a baby sleeping in it. They meet the Holy Family and share with them their story of the angelic visitation. And then they go and tell others what the angels have told them. They made known what had been told them about the child. The angel's announcement of a Savior, Christ the Lord is spread throughout the area, resulting in amazement in the hearers. Verse 19 says, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She has a lot to process, a lot to make sense of, and the shepherds do also. The passage concludes with verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The final scene in this passage finds the shepherds climbing back up the hill to where their flocks lie. The angel had told them what to expect, and that's what the way they found it. We leave them glorifying and praising the appropriate response to this unforgettable night. Well, let's pause here for discussion question five, based on verses 17 to 20. Great joy, praise, curiosity, amazement, telling others, thoughtful meditation. Which of these responses to the good news are present in your life? In what manner do they show themselves? If some are missing, why? What can you do to recover these responses? Okay, pause the DVD now and then resume when you finish discussing. Well, what are we disciples supposed to get out of this telling of the story of Jesus' birth? Several things. One, God brings good news to the poor and humble. The shepherds, sometimes despised by their countrymen, were the first recipients of the good news of Jesus' birth. Since God is no respecter of persons, we aren't to show favoritism either. Two, the glory of the Lord is powerful and huge. Just because we don't see it visibly doesn't mean that God isn't active. He often works in quiet ways. Only occasionally does he confirm his presence in miraculous ways. Three, Jesus is heir of David. We've talked about that. Four, Jesus is the expected Savior, Messiah, Master, Lord, God in our midst. Five, the good news is for all people, Jew and Gentile alike. Six, not all people, however, receive God's peace, but only those whom he has sovereignly chosen. <laughs> now, don't, le don't let suggestions of predestination trouble you. Be humble enough to allow God to be sovereign beyond your meager understanding of these things. Just deal with it. And then finally, number seven, appropriate responses to this good news include great joy, praise, curiosity to confirm its truth, amazement, telling others, and thoughtful meditation. Nowhere do we see unbelief. Let's pray together. Father, what an amazing night the shepherds had. To have a glimpse of your heavenly glory, to hear a mighty army of praise, to see the Messiah child, to listen to the angel recite his glorious title, Savior, Messiah, Lord. Thank you for letting us hear the story again. 
write it large and indelibly in our hearts that we might be fervent good news tellers too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.